Welcome back to Chasing Rabbits, guys. We are asking tough questions. Put this box in the classroom, and you guys gave us some questions, so let's see what's on the docket today. Oh, Bible and equality for women. That's a big one and an important one, and I can't wait to dive in. I also saw a related question in here. Is that it? Gender of God. Oh, Yes, guys, you are asking some amazing and important and timely questions. And, and these are important for us as Christians to know how to navigate these and our cultural milieu, because these are issues that really matter today. And it was the Bible's message on this uh, something that's going to resonate all the way to today? Or is it antiquated? Well, let's dive in together, my fam. Let's go. You know, I think one of the best ways to root ourselves in this text is to start with the origin point of humanity. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, the image of God is something we talk about a lot here at the Heart Youth. And you'll know that we, we unpack this as a, as a key understanding of, of who we are. What, what did they mean by image in the original audience? And so following the work of Dr. Catherine McDowell, one of my professors, this is an image of, of kinship, that our relationship with God is like that of a, of a parent to a child. Like look in uh, Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, and you have a relationship between Adam and his third son, Seth, being described in the same language, image and likeness. And so this is important that we're part of God's family. The other piece of this, kingship, images of, of, of God would connote, this was language that was specifically reserved for royalty in the ancient Near East. Okay, so this is important to our, our question here, because if this is language associated with kings and queens, and it democratizes the idea of royalty to all of humanity, this means that every male and female is made in the image of God, meaning they are of equal dignity and worth. And they're royal. They're children of God. And then this other piece, uh, the cult uh, reality of what they meant by image of God, this word tselem in Hebrew is most often translated as uh, like an idol statue. So we were actually supposed to be God's like living, breathing representatives, kind of mediating and representing his presence on earth. And guys, this is a title reserved for what? Just guys? Just men? No. Male and female, he created them in his image. So guys, this is a key understanding. No matter what uh, we add on to this understanding, this is the ground, the foundation point of understanding not only human identity, but specifically male and female as God created them in his image to represent him, to be royal, to, to have a relationship with him. And this idea of image, it's something representing who he is. And so to address that question there about the gender of God, let's do some reflection on this. So let's join some of the early church fathers, Gregory of Nizanius, Nizan, Niz, Nizanzus, Nazianzus, Nazianzus? I don't know, guys. I'm an Appalachian American. I'm doing the best I can. Quoting from a textbook that, that has a choose on this through the help of the church fathers. So here we go. The fatherhood of God, Gregory insisted, had nothing to do with sexuality or biological reproduction. Rather, it is a fundamentally relational notion. God is not a woman. God is not a man. God is a God. <clears throat> now you'll notice that God is often referred to as God the Father or God the Son and God the Spirit. We could talk about that word spirit, which could, in the Greek, it's, it's a neuter word, meaning it's genderless. In the Hebrew, it's actually a, a feminine word, um, uh, ruach, which is a, a feminine word. Uh, so if, if we're made in God's image and likeness as male and female, what does this say about God? Even though it seems like God has a, the, the preferred pronoun of father and son and spirit and, you know, two thirds of those are at least ostensibly male. And then what about the third? God being our father. And is he our mother too? Let's keep going with this reflection from Alistair McGrath as he's kind of chewing on early church fathers and mothers. We noted the analogical nature of such theological language. The use of such analogies means that persons or social roles largely drawn from the rural world of the ancient Near East were regarded as suitable models for the divine activity or personality. One such analogy is that of a father. 
get the statement that a father in ancient Israelite society is a suitable model for God is not equivalent to saying that God is a male human being or that God is confined to the cultural parameters of ancient Israel. Neither male nor female sexuality is to be attributed to God in that this sexuality is an attribute of the created order. There is no reason to suppose that such a polarity exists within the creator God. Now, Alistair McGrath, who we've been following in his kind of unpacking of what this means, is, is following Julian of Norwich, a medieval woman who's writing, uh, she's a theologian writing in reflection to God. So here we go. I saw that God rejoices to be our father, and also he rejoices to be our mother. And yet again, that he rejoices to be our true husband with our soul as his beloved bride. He is the foundation, substance, and the thing itself, what is by nature, he is the true father and mother of what things are by nature. And so, guys, this is really fascinating, this, this theological reflection. We're, we're joining uh, some of the early church fathers and church mothers and with the help of Alistair McGrath. I just want to get this down. When we talk about this image of God text that we just read, not only do we understand that male and female are created, both equal and royal and representing God, but that God himself is, there's something of God that is both masculine and feminine. And that really even, even in community, he had us uh, men and women represent kind of parts of himself. He's even greater than the sum of the parts. And so the gender of God, yes, we use language in the Bible through revelation, God making himself known through analogy, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And we understand these categories as something to understand and latch onto, and, and, and it's something that defines the eternal nature of God. And yet, to understand God as f only male or only female is short-sighted. Somehow he is fully both of these things, and that both of these things attest to part of who he is. So I hope that helps understand both the foundational reality of the equality of men and women and their incredible dignity and value in the eyes of God, and also God's complete uh, wholeness in representing both male and female, whatever is masculine, whatever is feminine, within God, both are there and both are celebrated as part of who he is. Yet, you may have noticed that the Bible uh, has a lot of patriarchal elements to it. And to point you to some resources that will more in depth deal with, with that reality, I'd really recommend this podcast from the Jude 3 Project. Uh, it's an apologetic ministry, and I really enjoyed listening to their their conversation called Courageous Conversations, and it's about patriarchy. So uh, check this out. I'll put a link in the description here in the YouTube video. In the meantime, uh, let's dive into this because I think this question that we're talking about is rooted in an observation that much of the Bible, uh, not only God revealed himself in, uh, in patriarchal cultures, which if you read Genesis 1, man, that, that, that would have been a subversive and a challenging read for people in its ancient audience. So I just want you to hear the freshness of that verse and the, uh, you know, culturally progressive uh, for the time it was being spoken, the idea that men and women were not only equal, but were held with such value, uh, not just kings and queens, but all of humanity being made in the image of likeness of God, huge foundational reality. But if we hit fast forward through the Bible, you'll notice women are treated like property. There are men that marry more than one wife. There's a lot of uh, cultural issues uh, in the ancient Near Eastern culture. Did God uh, not push against these? Did, did, did the reality, the living out of the image of God not address these structural issues that, that uh, prevented female equality? Well, I do want to just add some some little strands to the story here. There were female judges. We got Deborah. Read the story of Deborah in the book of Judges, and you'll find an incredible leader at a, at a time when Israel's men, at least particularly in the book of Judges, really fell short uh, of what God wanted them to do. There's a queen of Israel, the queen of Athaliah. Yes, there was a queen sitting on Israel's throne at one point in time. 
But as we move forward into the New Testament and you interact with the ministries of Jesus and then the church gets started, there's actually a lot of explicit instruction related to men and women and to family life and all of these things. And this video is not long enough and uh, to be exhaustive on these categories because there's there's different arenas, right, where these, these uh, pieces of advice of living out the New Testament kingdom, uh, kingdom of God norms, challenge the Roman order, but also maybe to our ears sounded a bit regressive. They sound maybe in, a, in our own cultural context like they didn't go far enough. I do want to point you to the work of, of a guy named William Webb, and there's a fantastic book he wrote about something called tra the trajectory of hermeneutics. We could wrestle with a similar question about how the Bible deals with slavery. Is the Bible um, anti-slavery or not? And and he starts to to show you that during the culture of revelation that God revealed himself to ancient Near Eastern culture in the Old Testament days, that the slaves' rights that are included in the scripture didn't abolish slavery com completely, but the slave rights that are included in the Old Testament are actually incredibly progressive. And then you get in the New Testament, you got people like Philemon, who uh, Paul is writing to and telling him to greet his escaped slave, Onesimus, like a brother. And, and, and you have this incredible progress. You're talking about moving from, okay, yes, they're, they're people, treat them well, to, to greet him as a brother. And you see this trajectory in the scriptures towards um, really reading the scriptures as an anti-slavery document um, and the kingdom of God. Uh, if, you, if you really take to heart that foundational statement in Genesis chapter 1, uh, about all of humanity being the made in the image of God, and we should preclude that owning people obviously is uh, is is wrong and problematic on on many different levels. So he takes the same thrust with with women and talks about how for the time period, the way God when he addresses the treatment of women, um, it, it is it is uh, it moves the cultural bar um, towards a trajectory um, of a more egalitarian society. So. If you could follow that, I know I'm throwing, throwing a lot at you, but I just want to show you there are resources to dive deeper than what I'm about to go. But I do want to illustrate probably some of the things that are motivating a question like this, and we're going to dive into them in the classroom. But let's just take a look. I'll just say this, that uh, the Bible, um, when it speaks of women's roles, um, it's 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 confusing. Uh, I I'm a I'm an exegete by training. This is this is what I do, uh, not only for a living, but it's 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 I'm a biblical studies is is my program, and I I just want to say this is a uh, it's a lot to piece together because there's a lot of uh, perhaps you could say conflicting directions we can interpret what we have, particularly in the New Testament as it comes to women and the role they played in the church. What roles were they supposed to play? What roles were they um, um, perhaps uh, admonished out of, right? And so is that problematic? Are we reading these correctly? So I want to put the data on the table for you to sort through, and I'll make some maybe some summary kind of guide stones for you to interact with this material. But uh, there's just a lot to pull from. Now, where is this idea that maybe the Bible is um, <laughs> not so, uh, it, it, that perpetuates patriarchy within the church? Well, you get some really challenging texts like 1 Corinthians 14. Let me read a little bit of that for you. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Now, I do want to add, what is going on here, right? Our initial question is like, is this coming out of nowhere? What, what is this? Let me read another one as well. First uh, Timothy chapter 2, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. She must be silent. Okay. Whoa. All right. So what's up with this? We're reading and both of these written by Paul. We're going to keep that in mind. Um, written by Paul. What did he mean? Now, uh, some people have taken it upon themselves uh, to believe that this is an absolute ban on women speaking in the church or holding positions of authority in, in respectively in, in each of those texts. 
and uh, texts like this are difficult. What's really fascinating, if you do uh, some reading around the passages um, and, and you consider the cities in which these are written in, um, Corinth, 1 Corinthians written to Corinth, and then um, uh, 1 Timothy written to uh, Timothy and his church in Ephesus. Both of these um, particular cities had actually like the prominent deity in the city was um, was a goddess. So it, for uh, for Corinth, it was Aphrodite, and for uh, Ephesus, it was Artemis. And some people have, have come to the conclusion that Paul is actually speaking to a particular group of women in either churches who are being problematic. In addition to that argument, um, later, earlier on in, in 1 Corinthians, there's a, a conversation about head coverings and that women should wear their head coverings. A um, guy named uh, Ben Witherington III, I, I recommend his scholarship on this material, um, he, he, there's a there's a practice uh, of head covering. It's actually related to the the tradition of women covering their heads in order to lead worship. And and this would have been a Greco-Roman practice um, uh, associated with paganism. But in other words, that um, Paul wanted them to preserve. Yes, I'm a woman, but that means I'm I'm speaking. And so there is this conflicting evidence even within the book. And there are particular contextual factors in the two books that address this most plainly that cause us to pause and, and to, to wonder and to consider and to dialogue with the rest of Paul's literature and the rest of the scriptures that Paul perhaps isn't talking about a permanent ban because that would be too, um, the, the, the argument goes that, that, that that's a bit too simplistic because there's obviously if he's allowing them to wear head coverings, that's actually indicating that they're in a speaking role. And as we'll see in a minute, there are women listed explicitly as teachers. So whatever is meant by these two verses that people sometimes march under the banner of, uh, perhaps um, they haven't done due diligence to dialogue with the rest of Scripture that would actually paint a rather more permissive, um, and I, I would argue egalitarian, technical word, uh, view of women in leadership in the Scripture. So let's just dive into that real quick. So on the other hand, uh, you have some very explicit texts um, Priscilla. You guys heard of Priscilla? Priscilla is listed as a teacher. So let's read that real quick. So let's see this in, in Acts chapter 18, verse 26. There's uh, a guy named Apollos who was preaching the gospel, but he kind of needed some more teaching. He wasn't uh, kind of up to speed with the, the uh, kind of the collective whole of, of the group, and they wanted to, to educate him. And it says here, this is Luke recording early church history, and it says that um, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. That's speaking of this uh, guy named Apollos. Um, when Priscilla and Aquila, now it's interesting, the wife is mentioned first, um, heard them, they invited him to their home and explained to him uh, the way of God more adequately. And so what we have here is that the, the, the pair is seen as teachers. So Priscilla is a teacher. So whatever Paul meant in 1 Timothy that he doesn't permit women to hold authority of a man, we have a, a picture here that, um, and, and these were colleagues with Paul, um, that Paul's colleagues, including female Priscilla, who's mentioned before, Aquila, her husband, is responsible for the theological education of Brother Apollos. So whatever Paul meant to Timothy, clearly we have to hold together this other piece. So what else am I talking about? In Romans uh, 16, 7, um, people have talked about this. It's easy to just kind of skip over some of these, like, because you're reading letters. You're going through other people's mail. That's, I mean, we're coming up with a theology of, of understanding um, women's roles in, in church life um, through reading other people's mail. It's, it's in here, but we, we got to let the whole thing talk. So this is uh, chapter 16. It goes to the personal greetings. You might be tempted to check out. Nobody's life verse is in this section. Um, but maybe you'll may, want to make yours one of these. So uh, he has a bunch of greetings to the church in Rome, uh, Paul writing here. And in chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives 
who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. <laughs> so holds these these this pair in particular regard. Andronicus, that's a male's name, and Junia, that is a female name. So, and she's listed as what? An apostle? That's a position of great authority in the church and in the first century. And these were Paul's co-workers. So whatever Paul is communicating to the particular interesting dynamics in Corinth and the particular interesting dynamics in Ephesus through the first Timothy, we must allow these things to dialogue with the whole of not only the New Testament, with the whole of scripture, including Genesis 1. Now, that being said, people have, have come to see that there are certain uh, roles in church life that are up for debate when it comes to reading the text. The people, the, the best exegetes here in, in, in Western culture and, and throughout the world, um, I'm most familiar with, with how we chew on a, in America. We kind of landed in two places on these. Um, so one of these is called complementarian and one is called egalitarian. And the complementarians believe there are certain roles within church life that women are explicitly not mentioned and as holding or even barred from um, at, at the most critical read. Um, for example, eldership, for example, comp, uh, or, or, or preacher, uh, teaching pastor, something like that, um, that, that women are, are not explicitly permitted to, to hold that role. That's where the complementarians lie. And then on the, the egalitarian side of the argument, um, they believe that, that all of these roles are open now, either of these, I just want to say either of these absolutely value and, and respect and should, if they're reading scripture right, absolutely appreciate and fully embody and value that, that, that they're both of equal value. So either of these should, pro properly practiced should be positions of, of male and female equality, whether or not the roles are in different spheres, if that makes sense. So... Um, God doesn't want to do away with difference. You know, um, difference is not a problem. Male and female, not a problem. I think some people read these texts, there's neither male or female, Greek or Jew. He's talking about um, walls of hostility or hierarchy coming down. He's not talking about doing away with um, God-given difference. Because as we know from the scriptures in Genesis 1, that God represents himself through community, through interrelationality, through difference, contrast, male and female. He made them in his image and likeness. And there's something about those differences that we actually get to celebrate and fully represent God. So um, if we're egalitarian, maybe uh, don't forget that differences are good and, you know, the interchangeability of people, there's something inherently good about being a man, about being a woman. And if you're complementarian, if they, they're supposed to occupy different roles, let us not make a false hierarchy that somehow makes men and women of separate value. Um, so there's dangers in each. And I want to speak to that uh, maybe as a closing reflection. I know this has been an overview of kind of looking at kind of the data, kind of put, putting some key pieces together into understanding the tensions in this issue within the scriptures. All that to say the answer unanimously is that uh, to, to female equality, yes, they're of equal value. Some debate lies within churches about what roles they occupy and play. But nobody reading the scriptures in light of the cross, in light of revelation, in light of the spirit, should say that men and women are of, equal, of, of less than equal value. They are equals. Okay, so hear that loudly. That's the biblical witness to this issue. How they play a role within the churches and within families, there's a little bit more nuance and competing claims within the scriptures that require us to be patient and understanding with people that arrive to a different conclusion than us on these issues. And so we need to keep that in mind um, and we need to have a, a gracious space. And honestly, to me, this is exciting because it gives us the occasion to assess our cultural biases, to assess the things that have shaped us and, and, our, and the people that have shaped our commentaries and, and to assess church tradition in a way that's like, God, here's the pieces of this. Help us see how to 
to live out these things. And, and it gives us the opportunity to, 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 to reinvigorate the conversation between God and Scripture, between Scripture and experience and other cultures, and read globally how we understand um, embodying uh, the, 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 the kingdom witness when it comes to relationships between the genders. So uh, I, I want to I close with some reflections. Really good book if you want to dive into it. Um, Maybe it reframes this a little bit, neither complementarian nor egalitarian, by Michelle Lee Barnwell. Um, a Kingdom Corrective to the Evangelical Gender Debate. So let me just let me just read a little bit. Since the kinds of questions we bring to the text determine the kinds of answers we receive, we will reconsider those questions. The principal aim has generally been to define what women can or cannot do. Approaching the issue in this way, with the primary goal of determining what is allowable, can cause us to miss another explanation of gender that could reframe the way we understand the issue, in particular as it relates to God's greater purposes for his people. The focus on authority, leadership, equality, and rights tend to lead to yes or no answers that do not prompt deeper questioning. It is not that these do not matter, but rather that there is a way to reconsider them. The New Testament can reorient us in the purpose and implications of our new identity in Christ, including the corporate dimension as the people of God in relationship with him and with one another. The gospel redefines power and authority in terms of humility, sacrifice, and suffering, not simply as qualifiers, but as essential components, even starting points. Guys, I hope that's a helpful word to close this. It's simply keep asking those deep questions. Keep interrogating the text, the church traditions, ourselves, our own motives as we engage these difficult topics. But overall, the Bible presents a picture of the incredible, radical equality of all humanity in the eyes of God, that we're made in His image and likeness, and how we embody that, how we represent that, particularly as followers of Christ redeemed into this new humanity. It's a preview of the kingdom come. These preview people that we want to be, how we live these things out must testify to that reality. And we attend the text and we try to understand Paul in his context and we try to understand Luke in his context and all of these writers and understand Jesus and, and the, 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 all 66 books of the Bible. We must let them dialogue with our hearts and with our souls and with our, our practice with one another. And we'll keep asking deep questions and believe that God will help us to model the beautiful reality of being made in his image, male and female. So I hope this is a helpful exploration, a look at the lay of the land, some of the, the threads in this conversation. And with or without providing an overclear answer, I hope it gives you enough sense of mystery that uh, these conversations are live. They're live in churches today, and God is, is, is in them. So let us attend to that and to one another as we attempt to model the amazing beauty of being made in God's image. It's something that people need today. So men, women, let's continue to represent God and his kingdom and how we treat one another, how we relate to one another, and how we do church together. All right. Godspeed, and we'll see you next time for the last rabbit hole on Chasing Rabbits.